All right, let's get started again. Um, I didn't go, there were a couple slides at the end I didn't go through on M&A modeling. Um, I'll just point these out to you now. Um, if you do want to do the full merger model, we've got some assumptions um, in the, at, toward the end of the slides. Very similar deal to what we spread here in class today. Um, but we also have a step-by-step -step approach for the full M&A model as well. So basically slide 24, slides 24 and on will give you a step-by-step walkthrough of how to put together that model. Um, basically one tab to the next will give you screenshots of what the completed worksheet should look like. So here obviously is a pro forma balance sheet after it's been done. Okay, we've got the full model, the model tab, we've got the assumptions, more assumptions, cash flow statement, debt schedule, etc. synergies model. Okay, then back on the first tab, analyzing the deal, what is the ultimate impact on earnings per share, All right? Base case upside, base case upside, 08, 09. All right, so you can go through that as well. All right, nice little helpful guide if you choose to do that, uh, that full merger model. We're done in Excel at this point, so if you want to shut down your laptop, you can. Um, you won't need it tomorrow necessarily. Um, basically, from here on out, we're going through um, you know, PowerPoint. All right, and the rest of today, we're going to talk about the M&A sale process. So basically, what do bankers do after they've won engagements with clients to sell, to sell companies? All right, we probably all know there's a wide array of different options that are available when structuring a sale. We'll talk about some of those in a moment. But basically, an M&A banker is going to work with the client to do a number of things. First of all, analyze some of the exit strategies that could be employed. Who might buyers be for a particular offering? We'll talk more about these a little later today. We'll also talk about some of these tomorrow when we talk about pitching, how and how those get identified and presented to clients. Obviously, valuation is important in any transaction, so that's a major component of M&A. Timing of the sale, tax consequences. We don't get into a lot around taxes in this course but taxes can be very important in any transaction, can make or break any particular deal. So that's something that M&A bankers and accountants spend a lot of time on. Um, and then, you know, what, what type of role, if any, might <coughs> key management team members and employees have on a post-transaction basis? Sometimes that can be very important. Um, that can be an important consideration in these deals. All right, so... Outright sale, um, you know, a lot of times that's what's pursued in M&A. Company just sells 100% of itself, but is not, you know, that's not always the best or the right option for a company. There are other different alternatives that can be employed. Um, retaining some equity in the business, maybe selling the company to, to employees, maybe divesting of certain divisions or certain assets of a company, maybe bringing in some working partners, maybe bringing in a joint venture partner bring some additional equity into the company. There might be some other hybrids as well. There are a lot of different options here. All right, what we're going to talk mostly about today, though, is selling 100% of the business or maybe divesting of a division or something like that. What steps does an M&A banker take in that process? With any transaction, though, confidentiality is always a major issue. If you go to work for an investment bank, you're, it's going to be drilled into your head. You have to keep things confidential. You'll sign all different types of agreement saying that you can be held, I think, criminally liable in some cases um, for insider, for violation of insider trading laws. But, you know, a leak in a deal can have a major impact on that deal, can have a major impact on the client. All right, so if it gets out that a change in ownership is being considered, obviously there are a lot of folks in the marketplace who could capitalize on that. Competitors probably being the most obvious. <coughs> All right, and ba basically competitors taking that information going out to different business partners, to vendors, to customers, creating a lot of upheaval in the marketplace. Um, because again, a change in ownership would cause a lot of those partners, vendors, customers to really question their relationships with the company, put a lot of their business dealings on hold until more of that, you know, more of those issues regarding ownership are flushed out. Um, employees, obviously, if, if a leak gets out among employees, 
major consideration, major concern, right? Employees are concerned about their job. Um, you know, basically going to really be questioning, standing around the water cooler, talking about how a pending sale or a potential sale might impact them. Right? So that can be a major issue. Um, and obviously with public companies, it's an even bigger issue if that gets out into the marketplace, insider trading, all of those different things can affect stock prices, can affect whether a deal even happens, et cetera. Um, so you know, basically if there are leaks, it usually reflects a poorly run process. Um, can really have a major negative impact on a bank's credibility. So as an analyst, as an associate, if you're on a deal team at an investment bank, it will be drilled into your head. You can't talk about it to anyone for any reason at any time. Just no exceptions. So what does the banker do once they get hired? Once they get hired, they're, they're basically being brought in to run a fairly well-defined process. Right? There's really not a, lot of, um, not a lot of secrets as to what goes on in M&A. Um, it's a pretty standardized process these days. Um, it's basically an execution role where the banker is doing a number of different things. And we're going to talk about each of these in detail the rest of today, but things like, as we discussed a moment ago, defining, working with the management team to help define what exit strategies might be available to them, valuing the company. Um, obviously, like I said, valuation is always a major part. Possibly recasting some financial information. All right presentation, packaging, putting together a deal book, putting together materials that are going to go out in the marketplace, that are going to be sent out to potential buyers, um, qualifying those buyers, figuring out, you know, to Muhammad's question earlier, who would be a good strategic fit, who would be a good cultural fit, do they have the capacity and the capability to close a deal, do they have liquidity, have, do they have a track record of acquiring companies, figuring out who are the likely and best buyers, marketing the Offering, obviously, M&A. If you're on the sell side of M&A, it's a big marketing role. Okay, very time, um, very time intensive process. Coaching management in terms of what can and cannot be said once buyers start coming to the table and we start presenting to buyers. Um, once we get under contract with the buyer, facilitating something called we do, that we call due diligence. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And then finally, negotiating, hammering out a price getting a contract in place and closing the deal. Right, so again, we're going to talk about all of these different things in the slides ahead. When we talk about sales strategies, we can think of, think of this in terms of four, the slide says four different types of strategies. Really, it's four different, I think, levels of how broadly we market a transaction. Right? Everything from an auction process where we're marketing a transaction very broadly, trying to attract the absolute maximum number of potential buyers, all the way down to a closed negotiation where maybe we're only engaging with one potential buyer. We're going to talk about all these in a second. Yeah. Like I said a moment ago, this is usually the most broad marketing effort that we might engage in, going out to anyone and everyone that might have a potential interest in this company. Competitors, maybe suppliers to the particular industry, maybe companies in related industries, financial buyers, private equity firms. Right, going out and quote unquote boiling the ocean. Right? We don't want to miss a buyer here, is kind of the goal. And through that, we want to attract maximum potential value, maximize the amount of competition for what we're trying to sell um, in order to accomplish that. Um, and that, you know, if, if we can do that well, there are obviously some advantages to that. Hopefully, it means maximum price. Hopefully, we, we don't miss a buyer. And because of that, we stimulate mo the most amount of competition. The real big disadvantage here um, is on timing. This can be a very, very tedious, time-consuming process. Obviously, if we're reaching out to a large number of potential buyers, there's a lot of contacts that need to be made. There's a lot of materials that need to be sent out. There's a lot of follow-up that needs to take place. There's going to be a lot of folks asking a lot of different questions, and all of those things take time. And right, obviously, if we get involved in an auction process, and between start and finish of that process, a lot of things can change, right? We could have September 2008, where Lehman fails and the market craters, valuations plunge 40 or 50 percent, could kill the deal. All right, so obviously that's a major disadvantage. Obviously also confidentiality is an issue. If we take this out to the world, everybody's going to know about it, including employees, including competitors, including our partners, vendors, everyone we deal with is going to know about it. We would need to be able to um, we would have to be prepared for that and be prepared to manage that 
situation. Um, we also get greater risk of what we call phishing, and that's basically competitors, different parties trying to get involved in the process, not because they're interested in buying, really more because they're interested in learning what are our secrets. What's the secret sauce? What's the secret formula of Coke? And those types of things. And if we're not successful, that is, if we go out to the marketplace and we don't get a deal closed and we have to go back out, there's no one else new to go back out to. So when people start seeing a deal two and three times, they obviously start to wonder, well, why didn't someone else buy it earlier? Right? And that can only have really one, that can only impact valuation in one way. Right? Over shop deals, valuations tend to fall. Make sense? All right, so that's an auction process. We might also engage in something called a controlled sale. This is, you know, again, now this is taking the, taking the offering out to a more limited universe, still marketing it pretty broadly. Okay, so if we go out in an auction process and say we approach 50 different buyers, controlled sale might be approaching 20 different potential buyers. All right, so it's still a pretty large universe that we're going out to, um, but probably trying to focus on, on more logical buyers than just, you know, doing a full blast or boiling the ocean, as we say. Okay, so we maintain a little bit of con confidentiality, hopefully while still getting a good amount of competition, getting a good you know, a, a approximation of market value. Um, we still run the same issues, same, a lot of the same problems we talked about before. You know, competitors getting access to this. There's a confidentiality issue. Timing, it's still not a fast process. Right? This is still probably going to take some time to get done, and there's still that issue, that risk of, of phishing, as we talked about before. The targeted high-level solicitation, again, we're casting here a narrower net, approaching only you know, logical buyers. Maybe, some, maybe we've done some qualification in advance to figure out that of that 50, or maybe of that 20 that we talked about in a controlled sale, maybe only 10 really have the capacity to close a deal. All right, so maybe we'd only approach them um, or limit it based on some other factor. Typically, contacts are going to be made a lot more directly. We're not going to just broadcast out a lot of marketing materials. We're going to really try and limit the extent to which this gets out in the marketplace. Ideally, what we're accomplishing here is speed, right? getting a deal done quickly. As we'll talk about later and as we'll talk about a little tomorrow, a lot of times speed and certainty really outweigh valuation. All right? And I think we can probably all think of instances in which that's the case, all right, but getting out to the marketplace, getting a deal done quickly, maintaining confidentiality, all right, obviously if we're taking it out to a limited market, if we're not successful, there are still a lot of other buyers we can go out to, okay, so we can avoid some of that risk of uh, being perceived as a shopped or an overshopped deal and hopefully still create some competition. Okay, the only real disadvantage here is just not risking or not reaching the full range of buyers. Maybe we're missing someone. And then finally, we've got what we call a closed negotiation. This is the most limited type of disclosure. We're really only going out to maybe one, two, three parties, maybe just folks that have expressed an interest in the past at buying the company. Um, again, here the, the main goal is to get a deal done, get it done quickly, and move on. All right, so here we may not like I said, sometimes there's a trade-off between speed and certainty in valuation. So here we may not be maximizing value, but ideally we're accomplishing our goal of getting a deal done quickly. All right. I think the rest of that's pretty clear. All right, so valuation. All right, well, all the traditional methods that we've talked about here in class are what we use in banking. Comps, precedent transactions, DCF. Obviously, if we're talking about an M&A scenario, we're talking about the sale of a controlling interest, we're probably going to focus, at least to the extent that we can, on precedent transactions. It's probably the first place we're going to look, but we're going to look at all different types of analyses here. And this can take many, many weeks. All right, so after we get hired, going into a pitch, we might have an idea of valuation, but after we get hired, we're probably going to spend a lot of time, we're probably going to you know, descend on company headquarters, or gather in a room somewhere and basically get full access to all the books and records of the company, access to the management team, access to the CFO, really fine tune that valuation expectation that we had early on in the pitch process. All right. 
get to look at a lot of things like customer lists, sales pipelines, product roadmaps, product development materials, that type of thing, to really understand those projections and really fine tune that idea of valuation so we can go out and sell that to the marketplace with confidence. All right, and one thing I'll note here is when we're talking, and we'll touch on this a lot more tomorrow when we actually talk about pitching, but when we're talking to the client in the early stages, when we're pitching and trying to win the business, it's usually important to give a reasonable picture of valuation at that stage because eventually it's something we're going to have to perform on. In other words, if we go in and we tell the company we think we can, value, we can get you know, $5 billion in a sale, but later we come back and we have to say, well, you know, it's really only about $3 billion. Um, that's going to create, obviously, a political problem with the client. It's going to be, need to be managed later on. So it's important to be reasonable, realistic, somewhat realistic in the pitch process up front when we're selling the client on what we can get them. All right, good bankers find value beyond the standalone business. All right, looking at different companies, different buyers, trying to uncover buyer-specific synergies, or maybe it's a better cultural fit at one buyer versus another, better strategic fit, the opportunity to exploit revenue synergies, cost synergies, you know, that brand value might be worth more, or that brand equity and customer base might be worth more to one buyer than to another. All right, so this is really where the bankers need to dig in, really bring things to the forefront um, and, and identify different areas where potential buyers can, can achieve maximum value. We talk about recasting. We're talking about a lot of the different things that we've done. Obviously, normalizing the financial statements is one thing that we always do. Strip out non-recurring costs, strip out non-recurring income as well. All right, but really uh, making it very clear to the buyer what this asset might look like, what valuation should be, putting it right in front of them is really important here, and identifying kind of the true operating performance of the company. And this is where we're starting to wear our sales hat a little bit. M&A is a marketing role. We're out there trying to maximize value, so we're trying to position this as well as we can with potential buyers and still be justified in our, in our presentation and our marketing efforts. All right, presentation and packaging. Okay, when we take this offering out to market, we obviously have to have a deal book. We've got to have some information that we present to buyers. And this is where the bankers, this is where the sell side bankers spend a lot of their time, a lot of their, a lot of their effort is pulling together these marketing materials, putting them together and not just, you know, not in a way that reads like a 10K, really something that reads more like a sales brochure. All right, putting together things like executive summaries um, or teasers, CIMs, confidential information memoranda, helping coordinate management presentation materials, other materials depending on the situation. Um, these are usually very professionally put together, very well done, very slick. Um, and again, this you know, books can be very, very thick, very detailed, can take up a lot of a banker's time. We're going to talk about each of these different items in a moment. Right, so when we talk about different buyers, again, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, we're going to work very, very early on with management to try and identify and qualify a range of different buyers that we might approach here. And all of this, the selection is based on all of these items that we, we've touched on these before, but business culture, strategic fit, especially now buyer financial capability. Can they do a deal? Do they have liquidity to do a deal? <coughs> have they closed deals in the past? Can they close quickly? Those types of things. Legal conflicts, antitrust issues. And anytime a big deal gets done, it needs to go through Justice Department, antitrust. There's an HSR, Hart Scott Rodino filing that usually gets put together by attorneys and bankers. What do the customer bases look like? So opportunities to cross sell products from one customer base into another, or from one company into another's customer base. What are overall business goals, et cetera? And once we finalize a list, usually those lists start off being very long. And based on evaluation on these different criteria, you get down to a list of the best buyers and maybe a couple different tiers of buyers. And once we're there, that's when we start making phone calls. That's when we start reaching out to different groups to see whether they're interested. And this is where bankers start sending those teaser documents out. Right? First contact with a, with a potential buyer um, is where we, we reach out. We keep the company name confidential. 
We send out maybe a one or two page executive summary known as a teaser, giving some high level details on the business. A major retailer in the Northeast, revenues of 50 million, that type of thing, EBITDA of the last three years, you know, ranging from five to seven million. No name basis. No name, no names at this point. All right. Before we give out names, we need to get what we call an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement signed. So anytime we send out a teaser, it's usually going to be accompanied by an NDA, basically saying if the buyer's interested in learning more, they need to sign this non-disclosure agreement. It governs how they're going to use all this information that they get. It, govern it tells them that for a period of time, usually two, three, five years, they need to keep it confidential. They can only share it with employees and lawyers and different folks for the purposes of acquiring or evaluating the acquisition, that type of thing. Right? Usually pretty straightforward. Um, a lot of times there's not much negotiation on the NDAs as long as it's plain vanilla. Um, but sometimes buyers will come back and you, know, you can kind of tell this, you can get a sense for how serious a buyer is based on how extensively they negotiate the NDA. Right? If they're just signing it and sending it back, sometimes they really may not be all that interested. But if they're starting to spend some time and negotiate that, that can give you an indication of their interest. Um, and usually negotiations can be handled by the bankers. Usually it's a matter of changing a few terms here and there. If it's really extensive, sometimes we'll have to get the lawyers involved. Now, a lot of times private equity firms really don't like to sign them. Private equity firms see hundreds if not thousands of deals a year. The last thing they need is to have thousands of NDAs out there that they need to comply to under different terms and whether you know, materials get shredded or have to be sent back or the time frame to send them back or how long they've got to maintain confidentiality. So financial sponsors, private equity firms typically don't do it. They don't sign them. As bankers, we really don't get too concerned about that because private equity firms, if they were ever to breach confidentiality on a deal, kind of be like a, a banker breaching confidentiality it would ruin their reputation. You know, so if they did that, they probably wouldn't see they wouldn't see any other deals going forward. Um, sometimes they'll sign their own NDA. Right? They'll have their own standard form that the banker needs to agree to or the company needs to agree to, um, and that's you know one other way to get around it. But after the NDA comes back signed, that's when we can release the client name. That's when we can send that full confidential information memorandum, CIM, or offering memorandum, OM. We go by a number of different names. That's when we can send that to the buyer. And that'll contain a lot more information on the company. It'll contain their name. It'll contain financials. It'll contain customers, at least, you know, maybe top customers. Um, it'll contain some ideas of what their projections are going to look like going forward, those types of things. All right. A lot more information to allow the buyers to get a better sense of whether they're interested, truly interested in making an offer for the company. Um, and like I said earlier, this is not going to be worded like a 10K. This is going to be worded using a lot of marketing-oriented language, All right. really presented in a marketing format. Anybody ever see teasers or CIMs, anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you've done a few. Yeah, this is, you know, bankers will, you'll, if you're an analyst or an associate, you're going to be the one putting these together for the most part, um, spending a lot of time putting these types of things together, um, getting them out. If, you, if you've ever worked in commercial real estate, um, when a building or a piece of real estate, commercial real estate comes to market, you'll get these real thick, beautiful, glossy reports, beautiful pictures of the building or the, the asset. Um, it's kind of the same thing, but they can be very, very detailed in nature. Now, after buyers have reviewed the, the, the uh, CIM or the OM, usually the next step is going to be to get management and the buyer in a, in a room together, um, giving the buyer a chance to ask management questions about the business, getting a chance to you know, have a lot of the, the key people on the management team, CEO, CFO, maybe the VP of sales, maybe the VP of product development, talk a little bit about their respective areas and try and you know, answer borrower or buyer questions. Okay, this is probably one of the more challenging time-consuming aspects of this process for bankers. Um, number one, management teams are very busy. All right? So getting them all in the same room is very tough to begin with. Okay? Number two, though, a lot of times 
the decision to sell a company is not made at the management level. It's made at the board level. Right? So the management team, they may not be as incentivized to cooperate and play nice in this process because they know if the banker is successful in selling the company, they may be out of a job. All right? Unless they have like, stock options. Unless they've got a lot of stock <laughs> options where it's you know, particularly lucrative to them. But you know, a lot of times you don't need two CEOs. You don't need two CFOs. You don't need a, you know, two VPs of sales. Maybe sometimes you do. All right. But you know, that's one problem. Um, the other problem is timing. Another problem there is also coaching management and telling them what can or cannot be said in this process. Really kind of a difficult task for 25, 28-year-old you know, analysts, associates to be telling 65-year-old CEOs what they can and can't say in this process. All right. 60, 65 year old CEOs aren't used to being told what to do, um, certainly not by 22 and 25 year olds, right? So um, that's kind of an extreme example, but um, you know, if management is indeed sitting with competitors and presenting to them, you know, not only do we not want to upset the sale process, we also don't want to disclose too much sensitive information, right? Communication um, usually handled through advisors, all right? Clients here are not really to be talking to anyone. All right. Communications are handled by the bankers, by the lawyers, really to protect the client, really to make sure that, you know, like we just talked, to, talked about a moment ago, um, wrong things don't get said, et cetera. Um, we typically will have weekly updates with the board, with the management team, talking about status, talking about buyers, who's in, who's out, who's looking good, who's not, that type of thing. Now, when buyers decide after they've reviewed the CIM, after they've met with management, they've reviewed more of the documents, et cetera, if they decide they want to move forward, this is when you usually start getting letters of intent. Start getting written expressions of interest back from these buyers saying, yes, we'd like to continue forward with the process. We want to learn more. We want to get into what we call due diligence and do really kind of a deep dive on the company's books and records. LOIs, um, preliminary, they're non-binding. They usually give the banker and the client a sense, not for an exact amount or an exact deal structure, usually a range of values that, the, that they believe they could you know, be justified in paying. And these are reviewed extensively by the bankers, by clients sometimes as well, to figure out who gets into diligence, who gets to continue on in the process. All right. Obviously, if the client is looking to achieve a valuation somewhere around $5 billion. Someone coming in at $1 billion, probably not going to be worth con continuing the process with, right? So based on valuation alone, sometimes um, buyers might get, might get left out of the process. Um, sometimes based on transaction structure, certain buyers may not be, um, be, as, be as interesting to management as well. Okay, but this due diligence process is really now where Buyers get to come in, they've got, they get a lot more access to the company's books and records. They can look at full customer lists, they can look at full sales pipelines, look at some of the company's technology. If the company has a lot of real estate, examine a lot of the documents related to that real estate. Look at all the financial statements at a much deeper level. All right, so this is a sensitive time in the process. This is why we want to be very careful about whom to let into diligence. Um, because as we mentioned before, sometimes competitors will get into this process only because they want to get access to confidential information. All right, so we want to minimize that phishing as much as we can. Um, and buyers will send bankers, lawyers, accountants. They'll sometimes send folks from their own, you know, from maybe their own corporate development group or different areas of the company. Maybe t a chief technology officer might come so he or she can evaluate the technology related issues of the company that type of thing. And usually this is presented in what we call a data room. Right? This used to be a physical room, maybe at a lawyer's office, right? somewhere off-site from the company, but basically a physical room, all the documents are, are brought in. No one, you know, one person goes in, one person goes out, no documents enter, no documents leave, they're babysat, that type of thing. Um, now this is basically an online situation. These data rooms are hosted in an online format. Documents are PDF'd. Buyers get usernames, passcodes. 
right, and they get access to these, uh, these different data. These are set up by a couple different companies, Interlinks, Merrill is one that I've seen probably more often. All right. But it also, you know, obviously that minimizes travel, minimizes the need to have a physical room, minimizes all the document reproduction costs, et cetera. And another nice aspect of it is it actually allows um, even more monitoring of what buyers are doing. Because the seller, the bankers, for every single buyer can see when they're logging in to the data room, what they're looking at, how long they're looking at it, and whether they've printed any documents, all of those different things. And so if we see a buyer coming in and looking only at the, at the product roadmaps and the technology, not interested in anything else, we can probably get a sense that they might be there for, for the wrong reasons, right? So these online data rooms have become, uh, I think, a good, good tool in the process. After diligence, after buyers have gone through this process, they've had a chance to you know, spend some time and evaluate books and records and everything else. Um, this is where bankers will send out um, a, call, a call for best and final. You know, best and final offer basically saying by a certain date, certain time, you know, usually a Friday at 5 p.m. If you're interested in continuing, if you're interested in making a binding offer, you need to submit it. It needs to be in this form. It needs to state the exact dollar amount. No longer talking in terms of a range. We need to be down to a dollar amount. All right, how you intend to pay for it, cash, stock, combination of the two, right? If there's any earnout provisions or escrow provisions, those need to be specified. We talked about earnouts before. Um, usually, if someone is staying involved in the business post closing, they might get um, additional compensation based on the achievement of milestones. Um, any financial con or financing contingencies, right? If necessary, right? That is, does, does the buyer need to raise debt? or raise additional financing in order to be able to do the deal. Right? If they do, then you need to know that. Uh, really important, what is the proposed timeline? How quickly do you think you can close? Okay, obviously, one buyer that can close very quickly, all other things being equal, is going to be preferred to a buyer that's going to take a lot longer to close. Should make sense. What type of reps and warranties, representations and warranties are they requiring? What do they anticipate happening with key employees after the deal? Right. What happens to the CEO? What happens to the VP of sales, et cetera? Those types of things might be required at that point. Okay. And then best and final, usually contingent upon con confirmatory diligence. We'll talk about that in a moment. Right. After a buyer's selected, there's what we call confirmatory diligence. But when we're looking at these bids, this is the most fun part of the process. You've worked nights, weekends, for so long, putting together all this material, marketing it, and now you're starting to get some real, real bids back. It's fun to get LOIs too, but even better when you get best and final. But we're analyzing these bids based on you know, three basic principles. We talked a little bit about this earlier, speed, certainty, value, no particular order. Right? Obviously, in, vo in volatile markets, speed and certainty are going to, in many cases, trump value. 05, 06, 07, value was kind of in the driver's seat. You know, highest valuation usually won. Money was cheap. Anyone could come to the table and get a deal done. Now it's exactly the opposite. All right, so speed and certainty these days kind of, kind of rule where M&A is concerned. Going along with that point, highest bid does not necessarily represent the best one. Okay, and these days, cash is king. Uh, we look back on a lot of deals, especially if you look back to kind of the, the tech heyday, late 90s, early 2000s. A lot of those deals were done with stock. And a lot of the stock of those buyers ended up being worthless. And so com sellers gave up their companies, ultimately ended up with very little in the form of compensation. Um, these days, with volatility in the marketplace, again, cash, is, cash kind of rules. And sooner, you know, obviously money today better than money tomorrow. Quick timelines are preferred. Earnouts are not a guarantee, especially if they, if they run over a long period of time, especially if a lot of that compensation is really back-ended. That can be a concern. And unless we're talking about a leverage buyout, we don't want to see deals that require finance, or that have financing contingencies. We want to know that the buyer has the cash or has the availability under their lines of credit or can issue stock right now that the deal's been approved, that there's really no hurdles 
between, you know, between now and them getting the deal done. Okay, minimal reps and warranties, obviously, we don't want to have to give as the seller a lot of reps and warranties in the deal. Um, what happens to key management employees? Again, like I said, accepting the offer or the decision to sell a lot of times is a board decision, not a management decision. All right. So if the CEO is going to get the ax, he's probably going to parachute out with a lot of money anyway, like you said. Right? But um, that's going to be more up to the board than anyone else. Like I keep saying, certainty to close, certainty to close now, quickly, constantly being weighed against price. All right, and the last thing we want to do is, you know, have to go back to the marketplace because we've had a busted deal, start the process over. All right, not only has, you know, a lot of that time elapsed, a lot of our work been for naught, last thing we want to do is go back to the marketplace and say, yeah, you know, the last buyer couldn't get it done, what will you offer now? That offer is usually lower than what it was before, All right? You get that perception of being shopped. Once a buyer has been selected, they enter what they call confirmatory diligence. This is really just doing another real deep dive, making sure there are no skeletons in the closet, um, having accountants really test at a deep level a lot of the financial records, etc. Right? Also for the lawyers to look through a lot of contracts, make sure there's no quote unquote skeletons in the closet, as we would say. Um, but at this point, you know, if we are agreed on business terms, usually the bankers will take more of a back seat turn it over to the lawyers to paper the deal, put together the purchase and sale agreement, put together any other agreements, legal agreements that need to be done, and you know, basically outline that roadmap to closing. Okay. Ideally, the bankers don't really need to get involved all that much. A lot of times they'll participate on some of the conference calls with the lawyers, but not have to be directly involved in those decisions. And ideally, we close the deal, get to go to a nice closing dinner, typically some steakhouse, a lot of expensive wine, maybe less expensive wine these days. I don't know, we're in, a, we're in a bad recession, so, you know, maybe we're drinking the cheap stuff. I don't know, but hopefully we get a nice dinner. Um, a lot of times there'll be a tombstone put together. Anybody know what a tombstone is? It's, it's typically, um, um, it's, a, it's a memento about the deal, basically. Yeah, I've, I've got a couple, you know, I've actually got one electronically here. Um, Basically, something memorializing the transaction is usually set in Lucite, you know, maybe six by eight or so. Um, basically saying, you know, who is the buyer, who is the seller, and who advised on the transaction. A lot of times, what was the dollar amount? It's a six trillion dollar deal, and we're Goldman Sachs, and everybody gets one, we put them on our desk, and we're real proud of those. So it's basically a tombstone. Um, sometimes you get deal toys. Like if you do a deal for like, say, an aircraft manufacturer, you'll get you know, some model airplane with the deal terms emblazoned on the side. Or I, got a card I actually got a cardiac pacemaker as a, as a deal before, as a deal toy. So, <clears throat> And then hopefully um, at that point you can get some sleep. Because like I said in the first class, when you're on a live deal, especially if you're at one of the bigger firms you can spend, you can be basically living in the office. Um, until that deal's done. And bankers are working 100, 120 hour weeks, seven days a week. I think you have to work seven days a week to pull 100 or 120 hour a week. Um, so it's, it's pretty intense. So hopefully you can back off a little bit, get a little sleep, retrench, get back onto a new deal. You never know.